but I didn't say anything. I just sat there. I couldn't just sit there, I had to say something, so I looked at him and I said, Jesus, I love you, you can count on me. Everybody else may fall away, but I will not. You can count on me. He looked at me and he smiled and he said, Peter, you'll deny me three times before tomorrow morning. Ouch. The next thing I knew, we were wrapping things up and we were headed to the garden to pray. Once we got to the garden, um, it's, it just got crazy. Um, Jesus asked Peter, James, and myself to go further in the garden with him and pray, and we did. We tried. We kept falling asleep. Um, Jesus kept waking us up. I remember one time he said, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's true. It's all a blur. Uh, <laughs> I think this whole mess got started because of Judas. Did he really think what he was doing was right? There. There he is. He's the one you want. The one praying by himself. Now the others, they will come up and try to create some scene. But the one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. Now 30 pieces of silver, right? That's what we agreed upon. 30 pieces. Forget about the rest. The one that I kiss on the cheek, that's the one you want. A kiss? Judas betrays Jesus with the kiss of a friend? Uh, and then it, it got crazy. Uh, Peter, <laughs> Peter grabs a sword and he, he cuts off this guy's ear. And Jesus, Jesus just reached down and picked it up and put it right back on the guy's head as if nothing had happened. And then, um, and then they took him. I'd love to tell you that we fought for him, but we didn't. Everyone ran. I ran. I'm so ashamed. What have I done? What have I done? Was I so stupid to think that... I've killed him. I've killed him. I've crucified Jesus. I crucified Jesus. It's what the crowd wanted and that's what they got. And personally, I don't feel like that man did anything to deserve that, but I was just a soldier doing my job. When the governor gave his sentence, that's when I would go to work. I loved that job. I felt like I was administering justice every time I nailed someone to a tree. But that man, that man didn't deserve that. It makes sense to me. It makes no sense. There I was, rotten in a jail cell, for stealing, murdering. You name it, I've done it. And I knew the next time I stepped foot outside that jail cell, well, I mean, that was it. So the guards, they came and got me, and they put me beside this guy that was beaten to a pulp. Then Governor Pilate started asking the crowd, which one of these men do you want me to set free? I mean, it was obvious. I mean, the crowd, they're gonna say, let Jesus go. And then I was gonna tell them where they could go. And then the crowd, they started chanting Barabbas. I mean, I mean they were saying my name. They were saying my name over and over and over again. The guards, they threw me to the crowd, and, and, they, and they took Jesus to Golgotha. I mean, I mean one minute, I, I am a man marked for death, and then the next, I'm, I'm free. It made no sense. So I followed him all the way to Golgotha. I was stationed at Golgotha that day. 
We just raised the second criminal when they brought him to me. I'll never forget the way he looked. He'd been beaten, spit on, whipped. He was unrecognizable as a man. Hideous. What was left of his clothes were stripped off of him and he was thrown down on the cross. That's when I went to work. Generally, when you crucify a man, the first hand is the most difficult. The criminal wants to get away, he fights you. So I would have two soldiers hold him down, but this guy, he didn't put up a fight. I just thought he was exhausted. As an executioner, I've been called every name in the book. I've had men yell at me, plead with me. But I wasn't prepared for that. He looked at us. He looked at me. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He forgave me. Forgive them. He said, forgive them. Who is he? Forgive. It should have been me up there. I was the one that was supposed to be hanging on that cross. He took my place. Then I looked up, and I remember he took a uh, deep, agonizing breath, and he said, it is finished. And then, he died. Surely, this man was the son of God. This morning we're here to commemorate and celebrate the single most important and greatest event in all of history, the empty tomb. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Your eternal destiny depends on what you do with the information that you hear from God's Word. See, Jesus Christ died for you, was buried for you, and rose from the dead for you. You can have a new resurrected life in Christ. And let me say up front, the story of Easter never changes. The reason for Easter never changes. The scriptures never change. And we need to understand why we need Easter. So let me once again, as I do every Easter, tell you from the Word of God why we need Easter. And our children are going to begin the story at the end of Christ's passion. After all the sufferings of the cross, Christ arose.
Amen. So why did Jesus have to die and rise again from the grave? Well, we need to go back to the beginning to answer this. Genesis chapter number 2. In Genesis chapter number 2, in verses 8 and 9 we read, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there He put the man whom He had formed. And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now we'll jump down to verse 16. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. See, God loved man so much that He gave him a choice. See, God could have made Adam a creature that would uh, just worship Him and obey Him without even thinking. But He wanted man to have a choice. Listen, you truly can't love unless you have a choice. Love means you have a choice. And we see Adam's choice in Genesis chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, that your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat. All thy days of thy life, and I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow shall be thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Because of the fall, we're all broken. We all inherited a sin nature from Adam. Romans 5.12 says, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Romans 3.10 says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Listen, we have all fallen short of the glory of God. We have all been broken. And that means in order to get to heaven any other way than through Jesus Christ, we would have to be as perfect as God. That means if you've ever committed even one sin, it's enough to keep you from entering heaven. James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. If you're hanging by a ten-league chain over the Grand Canyon, how many links does it take to break before you fall to your death? One link. That's it. One sin is all it takes to plunge you to your death in the lake of fire. Revelation 21.8 says, But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters, well, that's not me. Well, there's one more here listed. And all liars. 
shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. How many murders does it take to make one a murderer? One. How many robberies does it take to make one a thief? One. How many lies does it take to make one a liar? One. Is there anyone here this morning who has never told a lie? Raise your hand and I'll call you a liar. We've all fallen short. We have offended the law of God and we're guilty of all. Adam committed just one sin. He ate from the forbidden tree. Think about that. When we try to excuse our sin or make it seem less wicked, remember that all Adam did was eat a piece of fruit. A piece of fruit. He simply disobeyed God once. And all disobedience is sin. And one sin is enough to keep you from going to heaven. One sin is all it takes. And for those of you who maybe believe that you can lose your salvation, well, then only one sin would it take to be lost again. If you could lose your salvation, you would do it daily. Well, I didn't do anything wrong. Okay, but have you done everything right? Have you loved God like He commands you to love Him every day, all the time? Have you neglected to talk to Him in prayer? Have you neglected to allow Him to speak to you from His Word? Well, yeah, sure I have. Really? Well, let me ask you, what's your formula? How do you know if you've loved Him enough? If you've talked to Him enough? If you've let Him speak to you enough through His Word? Is there anything in the Bible that tells us how long to pray or how long to spend in His Word? How to know that we've truly loved Him with all our heart, soul, and mind? What gauge do we have for all these things? Because again, James 14 says, 417 says, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. If you base your salvation only on the things that you don't do, think again. Because it would also be based on the things that you didn't do that are you were commanded to do. And if you mess up once, if you, if you didn't pray, if you didn't love God and your neighbor, which means everyone, if you missed a day in His Word, then you would have sinned and lost your salvation. All disobedience is sin. Romans 14, 23 says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now, in light of these clear scripture definitions of sin, and especially the one given in James 4, 17, I can say without fear of contradiction that no matter how dedicated the believer's heart may be, no one can live a perfect, sinless life. Adam ate a piece of fruit, and it plunged all humanity into sin. James says if you're guilty of one point, you're guilty of all. And that one sin had to be paid for. Man is sinful and separated from God, and a way needed to be made to bring back man to himself. Jesus redeemed us. He bought us back from the slave market of sin to set us free. Let's look at this illustrated in the birdcage. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Excuse me, son. Yeah? What have you got there? Got, got some birds, some wild birds. Really? Yeah. Where'd you get them? Got them in the field over there. There's a field with wild birds. Huh. Yeah. Well, if you don't mind my asking, what are you going to do with them? I want to play games with them. Games? Yeah, I can play games with wild birds, yeah. What kind of games? Um, sometimes I like to poke a stick in there, you know, and they'll be like going, caw, 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 like that, you know? And then sometimes I like to rattle up the cage, and they think it's an earthquake, and they love that. What happens to them after you're done playing games with them? Mm, usually I feed them to my cat. Yeah, my cat likes wild birds. I'll tell you what, I am fond of wild birds. You are? Yeah, let me buy them from you. You want to buy my wild birds? Yeah. Or no good for nothing, they can't do no tricks or nothing, and when you open this gate, they're just gonna fly away. How much? You're serious? I'm very serious. Five dollars. All right. Ten dollars. Okay. 
twenty dollars. They're wild birds. They're exotic birds. You found them in a field. An exotic field. All right, that's all I got. See you looking at the cage. Yeah. What do you got in there? You know what's in there. Mankind. Found them in the garden. The funny thing is they put themselves in that cage. I had nothing to do with it. So what's your plans with them? I'm gonna play games with them. Games? What kind of games? All kinds of games. I'm gonna put games into their life that they think is gonna bring them so much pleasure that I'm gonna turn the world upside down. I'm gonna make right seem wrong and wrong seem right. And then? They'll be damned for all eternity. My father and I, we're very fond of mankind. I know. We want them to have access to us. So, I'm going to pay for their freedom. You want these humans? Yeah. You know they've promised you everything before. They're going to turn their backs on you. Some will, and some won't. You're serious. Oh, I'm very serious. It'll cost you your tears. I know. Your blood. Yeah. It'll cost you your life. I know. You're willing to give your life. I'm willing to give what it takes. This reminds us about what Jesus did for us on the cross. He picked up that wooden cross and carried it to Mount Calvary because he loved you and me. Jesus went to the cross to pay the penalty for our sins, <clears throat> to redeem us from our fallen nature. I couldn't get to him until he came to me. I could never fall. From where I was to his demands, it seemed so far. I cried, dear Lord, I cannot come. To where you are, he came to me. He came to me when I could not come to where. Came to me. That's why he died. On Calvary, 
when I could not come to where he was he came to me he came to me when I was bound in chains of my sin he came to me when I possessed no hope within he picked me up and drew me gently to his side where today in his sweet love I now abide and I'm so glad for the day that he came to me he came to me when I could not come to where he was he came to me that's why he died on Calvary when I could not come to where he was he came to me When I could not come to where Jesus was, he came to me. Adam and Eve were given coats of skin to cover their sin. Genesis 3.21, we read, Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothed them. See, they tried to cover their sin with fig leaves, their own works. But God required the innocent to die for the guilty. In Egypt, when God used Moses to deliver his children from Israel, of Israel from bondage, God plagued Egypt with ten plagues. The last one is found in Exodus chapter 11, and verses 4 and 5 we read, And Moses said, Thus saith the Lord, About midnight I will go out into all the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in that land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sitteth on the throne, even unto the firstborn of the maidservant that is behind the mill, and all the firstborn of the beast. And then in chapter 12, beginning in verse 1 we read, and the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to him Take according to the number of the souls, every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. He shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. And he shall keep it unto the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the house wherein they shall eat it. And then verses 12 and 13 says, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. 
And the place shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. See, a lamb was to be slain and the blood was to be put on the doorpost, making the sign of a cross. And when God saw the blood, he passed over that house. If no blood was found on the doorpost, the firstborn would die. See, it was the blood that made the difference. Jesus said these words to Nicodemus in John 3, 3. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus says that we need a second birth. Just as in Egypt, the firstborn died without the blood, so will those who have only been born once physically here. You must be born a second time spiritually. On judgment day, when God looks at you, will he see the blood of Jesus applied to you because you've been born again spiritually? If you're only born first, if you're only first born, born only physically on that day, and God does not see the blood that has washed away your sins, then you will die just as the firstborn of Egypt died that night. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. The death that you will experience will be eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verses 14 and 15. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I've given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for your soul. See, the blood only covered the sins of those in the Old Testament. But the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Jesus is God's perfect lamb. John 1, 29, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now in the garden, we see in Luke 22, verses 47 and 48, And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou me, the Son of Man? with a kiss how in the world could Judas a man that had followed Jesus for three years he heard the greatest preaching that was ever preached and he had seen the miracles that Jesus had performed how could Judas betray him why the cruelty of the passion of Christ this is why the lamb had to be slain he was led as a sheep to the slaughter through the streets of Jerusalem to Calvary, so that we could have the answer to the question, why? Why did it have to be a friend who chose to betray the Lord? Why did he use a kiss to show them that's not what a kiss is for? Only a friend can betray a friend. A stranger has nothing to gain. And only a friend comes close enough to ever cause so much pain. And why did there have to be a thorny crown pressed upon his head? It should have been a royal one made of jewels and gold instead. 
It had to be a crown of thorns Because in this life that we live For all who would seek to love A thorn is all the world has to give And why did it have to be a heavy cross he was made to bear? And why did they nail his feet and hands? His love would have held him there. It was a cross for on a cross a thief was supposed to pay. And Jesus had come into the world to steal every heart away. Yes, Jesus had come into the world to steal every heart away. In Matthew chapter 26, beginning in verse 69. Now Peter sat without in the palace, and the damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of of Galilee. But he denied before all them, saying, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that that were there, This fellow was also with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied with an oath, I do not know the man. And after a while came unto him they that stood by and said to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. He began to curse and to swear, saying, I know not the man. And immediately the cock crew. And Peter remembered the word of Jesus, which said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he went out, and he wept bitterly. This is the account of Peter's denial of the Lord. You know, Peter was always putting his foot in his mouth. He was very impulsive. He said and did things without thinking them through. And even after Jesus himself told Peter that he would deny the Lord three times, Peter emphatically said that that would never happen. But it did, just as Jesus said. But before we condemn Peter for his denial, we need to understand that we may not say the exact same words that Peter used, but we still deny him when we keep silent about Jesus when we should be giving people the good news of Jesus Christ. But the Lord wasn't through with Peter, and he isn't through with us when we fail, even though we deny him at times in our lives. God restored Peter in John 21 when he told Peter, feed my lambs and feed my sheep. my lambs, my son, feed my sheep. If you love me, do not sleep. In the fields, my son, work and weep. Feed my lambs, my son, feed my sheep. To the maiden first he lied. You were with him, this she cried. But the master he denied. On the following day, Jesus died. Feed my lambs, my son, feed my sheep. If you love me, do not sleep. 
In the fields my son work and weep. Feed my lambs my son, feed my sheep. Someone whispered quietly, Aren't you Peter of Galilee? I can tell you by your speech, so you see. Peter lied and said, It's not me. Feed my lambs, my son, feed my sheep. If you love me, do not sleep. In the fields, my son, work and weep. Feed my lambs, my son, feed my sheep. Peter heard the cock when it crew. As he left, he wept and he knew. Every one of us is guilty too. That's why Jesus died just for you. Feed my lambs, my son, feed my sheep. If you love me, do not weep. In the fields, my son, work and weep. Feed my lambs, my son, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, my son, feed my sheep. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In Romans 5.8 it says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, the love of God is what Easter is all about. The human race was born in the slave market of sin, condemned to die an eternal death in the lake of fire. But God doesn't want anybody to perish. 2 Peter 3.9 says, For the Lord is not slack concerning His promises, some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God loved us enough to send His only begotten Son to take the punishment that we deserved. Jesus loved us enough to be beaten cruelly, shamed, and hung on the cross, the most horrific form of execution invented by man. You know, they put spikes into his, the feet of Jesus, into the hands of Jesus on that cross. But if Jesus were to ask us the question, what held him on the cross? Our answer should be, love is what held you on the cross. I've seen you all my life, a figure on a crucifix, a death without a fight. You were hanging there upon a cross, just by your hands and feet. The picture's clear, but the story's incomplete. So what was it that led you to that tree? What made you lay your body down to save someone like me? Cause though it's true, I know that you were God inside of me. And I guess sometimes it's hard to understand what held you on the cross when you could have walked away. I 
see what you have done And I just have to say What held you on the cross Was more than just the nails With all the pain and suffering And all that you had lost Your love for me could only be what held you on the cross you saw me I guess you must have known my life would be in darkness so you and you alone would bear the stripes the crown of thorns and all humility lord i see myself but it's hard for me to see what held you on the cross when you could have walked away i see what you What held you on the cross Was more than just the nails With all the pain and suffering And all that you had lost Your love for me could only be What held you on the cross don't deserve your mercy still you love me just the same you died for me and yet it's hard to know what held you on the cross when you could have walked away i see what you have done and i just have to say what held you on the cross was more than just the nails with all the pain and suffering and all that you had lost your love for me could only be what held you on the cross What held you on the cross? Shoulders hunched, the man plods through life, straining with every step to carry the great burden on his back. It's been his night and day companion. Not once has he known relief from this merciless weight. The man's name is Christian, the central character in John Bunyan's classic allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress. In one moving scene in the book, Christian finds the path to salvation. Up the hill he staggers until he reaches the peak. There he sees a wooden cross and just below it an empty sepulcher. As he nears the cross, a miracle happens. The straps binding the massive weight to his shoulders loosen and his load tumbles away into the sepulcher's waiting mouth, never to be seen again. A delicious feeling of lightness buoys Christian's body. A joy, joyous tears of relief stream down his face. Three shining ones appear and then approach him. The first announces, Thy sins be forgiven thee. The second strips away the rags and dresses him with splendid clothes. The third hands him the sealed scroll, which he is to present upon entering the celestial city. Overwhelmed by his new freedom, Christian sings, Thus far did I come laden with sin, nor could aught ease the grief that I was in. Till I came hither, what a place is this? Must here be the beginning of my bliss? Must here the burden fall off from my back? 
Must hear the strings that bound it to me crack. Blessed cross, blessed sepulcher, blessed rather be the man that there was put to shame for me. In this brief scene, Bunyan has eloquently dramatized the message that we are all pilgrims encumbered by a crushing load of sin. When we stumble to the cross, God releases our burdens, bearing them forever in Christ's own grave. Our own sorrows are released. Our burdens are lifted at Calvary, the place of the cross. In Hebrews 12, 2, we read, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame that, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For the joy that was set before Him, Jesus endured the cross. The cross wasn't what He enjoyed. It was what was beyond the cross. The cross was cruel. They beat Jesus with a cat of nine tails, which had pieces of bone and metal and, and glass and, and, and that stuff would embed into his, his back as they whipped him and, and it would stick there and, and they wouldn't just rip, pull it back off, they would rip it across his back, tearing chunks out of his skin. And they beat him so badly that he didn't even look human. And they nailed him to the cross with spikes Jesus didn't look forward to that, but he looked forward to what that, that would accomplish. Because of the cross, we can have salvation. Jesus endured the cross, suffering the beatings, the whippings, the shame, and the separation from his Father for the joy that the cross would bring through the salvation of all who would believe. Because the old rugged cross made the difference. was a life filled with aimless desperation without hope walked the man shell of a man then a hand with a nail print stretched downward just one touch then a new life began and the old rugged cross made the difference in a life bound for heartache and defeat and I will praise him forever and ever for the cross made the difference for me barren walls echoed harshness and anger little feet ran in terror to hide now those walls ring with love warmth and laughter since the giver of a life moved inside and the old rugged cross made the difference in a life bound for heartache and defeat and i will praise him forever and ever for the cross made the difference for me there's a room filled with sad ashen faces 
Without hope, death has wrapped them in gloom. But at the sight of a saint, there's rejoicing. For life can't be sealed in a tomb. And the old wrong and cross made the difference in a life bound for heartache and defeat and I will praise him forever and ever for the cross made the difference for me and the old rugged cross made the difference in a life bound for heartache and defeat and i will praise him forever and ever Matthew 27, verses 33 through 36. And when they were come unto a place called Golgotha, that is to say, a place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall. And when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture they cast lights. And sitting down, they watched him there. They crucified him. They drove nails deep into his feet and hands. The nails used to crucify Jesus were huge spikes, and they had to be driven through his feet and his hands. But who nailed Jesus to the cross? We did. It was our sins that drove the nails deep into his feet and hands. Jesus died for every single one of our sins. Do you understand that? Every sin we've committed, he had to pay for. We are the ones that drove the nails into his feet and hands. And it should cause us to reflect and understand that when we sin, that sin had to be paid for. And we were actually driving another nail into his hands. First, or Second Corinthians 521 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He became sin for us. Not a sinner, but he became sin. And that's why God turned his back on the cross. That's why it was dark for those three hours. God is light and he cannot look on sin, so he turns his back. And Jesus in his humanity bears the penalty for our sins. That should cause us to live holy lives as we think of the pain that we inflicted when he took the nails for us. It should cause us to say, I don't want to drive another nail into his hands. Sam was a carpenter 50 years He pounded out blood, sweat, and tears One day he hung his hammer up He wanted to do the things he loved What once was Sunday fishing 
now seven days a week. He told his wife to find me. I'll be down at the creek. Cause I don't want to drive another nail. I've worked hard to do my job and I did it well. I've got the scars on these two hands to show I haven't failed. But I don't want to drive another nail. Now she was a woman full of faith and old Sam was full of pride. And she knew that he had one more job to do before he died. Easter Sunday rolled around at a country church for the lost and found. Oh, Sam was there against his will as the preacher spoke on Calvary's hill of how they took the master and they nailed him to a tree. You could hear old Sam a crying as he fell down on his knees. I don't want to drive another nail. I want to live my life for you. I want to do it well. You've got the scars on your two hands that shows where I have failed. Lord, I don't want to drive another nail. I don't want to drive another nail. I want to live my life for you. I want to do it well. You've got the scars on your two hands to show where I have failed. Lord, I don't want to drive another nail. Luke 23, 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified Him. See, Jesus loved us enough to die on the cross. He loved us enough to suffer all the agonizing things that He suffered during His passion. Romans 5, 12 says, But God commended His love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 8, 9, and 10 says, And this was manifest, the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Here in His love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins, the acceptable sacrifice. Revelation 1.5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the king of the earth, unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. And then for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In verse after verse, we read of the love of God in sending His Son to die for us, and our, to take our place, to rise again from the dead, and it's because of love. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. God loves us and does not want anyone to die in their sins and perish in a lake of fire. He loves us and He wants us to be with Him for all eternity. And it's all because of Calvary's love.
their Savior. And all our lives that only Jesus satisfies. love will sail forever bright and shining strong and free like an ark of peace and safety on the sea of human beings through the hour by Calvary's love across their souls. Calvary's love, Calvary's love, priceless gift, Christ makes us worthy Till heaven's promise fills with joy once empty eyes. So desire to tell the story of a love that loved enough to die burns away. All other passions and fed by Calvary's love becomes a fire.
In John chapter 20, beginning of verse 1, it says, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulcher, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and said unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he in not. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which first came to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. Jesus rose from the grave. Imagine what it must have been like for Peter and John when they saw the empty tomb. And then what happened afterwards. Again, let's look at this. Example, this illustration from the skit, guys, our risen Savior. Peter, stop. We'll get the guys to help with the search and then we'll divide up, all right? We'll have Andrew take the north, Bartholomew will take the bottom. Peter, stop. Look, I'm just as confused about this as you are. Someone stole him. That's the only logical explanation, John. Wait, 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 wait okay? Look, what we witnessed today. I, I, the guards, they took him. We have to move swiftly. We have to rebury the body properly. Look, Peter, stop! Okay. We need to go tell the others. Tell them what? What we saw. We saw nothing. Exactly. John, do you not understand that they are trying to stop us? That's why Jesus kept waking us up to pray. That's why they got to Judas. That's why... That's why they arrested Jesus. Just the other day, I was looking at him. I was looking him in the eye and I, and I told him that I loved him and that I would follow him to the ends of the earth. He was supposed to be our king. He is the king. When we were in the tomb, I remember something Jesus said. The linens were just lying there. They, they, they were just lying there. No, no. Think bigger. Look, all of this, all of it was supposed to be preparing us for this moment, for that empty tomb. We just couldn't see it. Couldn't see what? Okay. When Mary came back and said that the tomb was empty and that the angel of the Lord was there, that's when it started to come back. John, enough. We can reminisce about this later. Jesus is missing. We have to go find him. He's not missing. That, that's the point. Look, he was trying to tell us about this. Jesus was preparing us for this. He's risen. Peter, he's a different kind of king and he always was. <clears throat> Peter, you remember that night Jesus asked us who we thought he was? When he called me Satan? Yeah. Yeah, I called him... Lord. Lord. Lord of all, Peter. We just didn't understand. But he's gone. No. He's risen. He did it. 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 Peter, he's risen. He's risen. He's risen. He's risen. He did it. Do you hear that world? He's risen. He's risen. He's risen. Easter is about Jesus coming to live a perfect, sinless life, 
shedding his perfect sinless blood, being buried in a tomb, and rising again three days later. The good news is that you don't have to die in your sin. You don't have to be separated from God for eternity in the lake of fire. So my question to you is this. How could you say no to this man? All of what we celebrate today is because of the Lamb. Jesus Christ was the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world, as proclaimed by John the Baptist. And, he's this, and He is still the risen Lamb that will be in eternity, as we see in Revelation 21, verses 22 and 23. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are in the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb was the light thereof. The Lamb. The Lamb. The Lamb that was slain for us was risen again. During Christ's passion, a man was compelled to carry the cross of Christ. 
Let's look at what he might have thought about that. Simon of Cyrene. I was going into the city to celebrate the Passover, and he he was being led out of the city as a Passover lamb. But we didn't we didn't understand that. Um, when I got to Jerusalem, it wasn't what I expected. I mean, there was like ten times more people there than the last time that I'd, I'd been there to celebrate Passover, and it just seemed like the whole city was angry, like just, just mobs of angry people. And all of a sudden, this this, this guard, the soldier, he, he grabs me. I mean, he literally just pulls me out of the crowd, and he says, for me to carry this guy's cross. If, if this guy's blood gets on me, it's, it stains me, and I, I, can't, I can't celebrate the Passover. That's the whole reason I was there. It was hard to see the man through the blood. And then our eyes met. And I knew this man was not a liar. He was not a, uh, a crazy man with grand ideas. He was, he was the Messiah. I carried um, what I could, but he uh, he, carried, he carried most of it. We we began we began to walk. I I, I heard the insults that that they shouted at him and and now at me. I felt the spit. I felt his his blood on me. They'd taken a, a crown made of thorns and then they smashed it on his head and, and, and blood ran into his eyes. They laid him out on a cross and they, they nailed his hands and his feet to it. And they, they, they lifted it up. And he, he had, he had all of his weight on that one spike through his feet. And he would, he would, he would push up with all of his might and, and gasp for a breath to stay alive. And I, I couldn't watch it. He did that for hours. I couldn't watch it. And, and I looked down, and I remember, I remember seeing my hands. My hands were stained with, with his blood, the, the blood that I thought would, would make me unclean. And I realized it's the blood, it's the blood that, that makes me clean. He breathed his last breath, and he died. And that was a uh, that was the day that I helped Jesus carry. That was the day that I helped Jesus carry my cross he hung and died on my cross this song tells a story of how Simon might have reacted to being compelled to bear the cross of Christ it speaks of the Lamb of God 
Have you accepted this lamb and what this lamb has done for you? Listen to the message of this song and understand what it means to watch the lamb. Walking on the road to Jerusalem The time had come to sacrifice again My two small sons They walk beside me on the road The reason that they came Was to watch the Lamb Daddy, Daddy, what will we see there? There's so much that we don't understand. So I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. Then I said, dear children, watch the land. For there will be so many in Jerusalem today. We must be sure the Lamb doesn't run away. And I told them of Moses and Father Abraham. And then I said, dear children, Watch the land. When we reached the city, I knew something must be wrong. There were no joyful worshipers, no joyful worship songs. I stood there with my children in the midst of angry men. Then I heard the crowd cry out, Crucify Him! We tried to leave the city, but we could not get away. Forced to play in this drama, a part I did not wish to play. Why upon this day were men condemned to die? And why were we standing here where soon they would pass by? I looked and said, even now they come. The first one cried for mercy. People gave him none. The second one was violent. He was arrogant and loud. I still can hear his angry voice screaming at the crowd. And someone said, There's Jesus. And I scarce believe my eyes. A man so badly beaten, he barely looked alive. Blood poured from his body, from the thorns upon his brow. Running down the cross, falling to the ground. I watched him as he struggled. Watched him as he fell. The cross came down upon his back. The crowd began to yell. In that moment, I felt such agony. In that moment, I felt such loss. Until a Roman soldier grabbed my arm and screamed, You! Carry his cross! I tried to resist him, 
and his hand reached for a sword. And so I knelt and took the cross from the Lord, placed it on my shoulder, and started down the street. The blood that he'd been shedding was running down my cheek. They led us to Golgotha. They drove nails deep in his feet and hands. And yet upon the cross I heard him pray, Father, forgive them. Oh, never have I seen such love in any other eyes. Into thy hands I commit my spirit, he prayed, and then he died. I stood for what seemed like years, I lost all sense of time, until I felt two tiny hands holding tight to mine. Children stood there weeping. I heard the oldest say, Father, please forgive us, the lamb ran away. Daddy, Daddy. What have we seen here? There's so much that we don't understand. So I took them in my arms. We turned and faced the cross. And then I said, dear children, watch the land. The choice is now up to you. Just as God loved Adam and gave him a choice, he loves us enough to give us a choice. You can, you can choose to accept Jesus or reject him. He will not force you either way. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then verse 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the Lord, the name of the Lord shall be saved. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb covered the sins of those who applied it to their doors, the blood of Jesus, the Lamb of God, will wash away the sins of those who were born a second time spiritually. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is alive? And that he wants to live in your heart. Will you call on him right now? Let us pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd say, Pastor, I'm not sure that if I were to die today, I'd go to heaven. I'm not sure that I'm a child of God. But now I understand what Easter is all about. Jesus coming to earth to pay the penalty for my sin. To die for me. To shed his blood to wash my sin away. I've been trusting in other things to get me to heaven like my good works. or I've, I've been trusting my baptism or my church denomination or communion. I've been, I've been trusting these things. But now I understand that that's not going to get me to heaven. I now believe that Jesus is the only way. And I want to call on him and ask him to save my soul. If you're here and you'd like to be saved, this is the prayer you can pray. You can pray it in your heart. And God will hear. And this is what you can say to him. Father, 
I understand that I'm a sinner. And I deserve to be separated from you for eternity in the lake of fire. But I believe that you sent your son Jesus to take my place, to die for me, to take the penalty that I deserve upon himself. I believe that Jesus not only died, but he rose again the third day after he was buried. And I now ask God to be merciful to me, a sinner. Save my soul for Jesus' sake. I thank you, Lord, for dying for me. I thank you for saving my soul. For I pray this in Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye is still closed. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer. I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Would you just let it be known by lifting your hand? Anyone? Pastor, I prayed this morning to receive Christ as my Savior. Any, anyone? Just raise your hand. Nobody's looking around. I've asked the Lord to save my soul. Father in heaven, we thank you for the day that we celebrate the resurrection of your son, Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that if there is one here this morning who's still not sure that heaven would be their home if they were to die, continue to speak to that heart and draw them to salvation before it's eternally too late. And Lord, for those of us who know Christ the Savior, Lord, let us live for him daily. Let us go forth from this place rejoicing for what the Lord has done for us and be willing to tell others that they too can experience the forgiveness that is found in the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And Lord, we thank you for our, our service and we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. That ends our service this morning, and just want to say thank you to Tyler. Uh, Tyler put together that whole thing, and it takes a little bit of time to put all the scripture verses, the videos, and things like that together, so very thankful for Tyler for all the hard work that he did to make it so you guys could have something to view while we were doing that, so thank you, Tyler. Thank you. Up on the screen, Jesus paid it all. Just the lyrics on the screen will be fine. I'm just them three. <clears throat> The Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thy all and all. And Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain he washed it white as snow.